They call these armored limos the beasts, and today their wheels got to crunch the gravel at Checkers, not in menace, but in apparent remorse. This trip to rural Buckinghamshire, as opposed to iconic number 10, was always going to be a little awkward. But the president was on an apology tour, greeted by an ashen-faced hostess, smiling, but never with her eyes. Whether it was the retinue of advisors who finally managed to get into his head, or the daunting family portraits in the Great Hall, the ghosts of the past bearing down on the man from Queens, New York, Donald Trump looked like he was facing the diplomatic equivalent of root canal surgery for what he had said to the Sun about her and Brexit. I would have done it much differently. Uh, I actually told Theresa May how to do it, but mm. she didn't agree with She didn't listen to me. What did she say? She didn't listen. No, I told her how to do it. I, uh, that will be up to her to say. But I told her how to do it. She, just, she wanted to go a different route. Some had wondered whether after such a slur, uh, yeah. Theresa May would go full love, actually, it, uh, as in the inspirational movie. A friend who bullies us is no longer a friend. And since bullies only respond to strength, from now onward, I will be prepared to be much stronger. But in the warm summer air of the walled garden, instead of love actually, we actually got love, or some version of it. Whatever was said behind closed doors, in the outdoors, we saw a very different Donald Trump. This incredible woman right here is doing a fantastic job, a great job. And I mean that. And I must say that I have gotten to know Theresa May much better over the last two days than I've known her over the last year and a half. I mean, we've spent more time in the last two days. Yesterday, I had breakfast, lunch, and dinner with her. Then I said, what are we doing tomorrow, which is today? Oh, you're having breakfast and lunch with Theresa May. So whatever next, Mrs. May stuck to her script like a shield. It is all of our responsibility to ensure that transatlantic unity endures for it has been fundamental to the protection and projection of our interests and values for generations. So what does Trump's best Mr. British Mr. friend make of it all? This was a, a mildly apologetic, um, much calmer, uh, polite uh, Trump, uh, but the words didn't sound that convincing to me. Well, here's the point. If he goes from insult to apology and then perhaps back again, how can she trust him? Well, there is an unpredictability about Donald Trump, and I think you know, we've seen that through foreign policy and in many other areas. Um, I think the trust, quite frankly, I think the trust is not her trusting him, it's him trusting her. You know, she has been telling the world a series of things that, frankly, are not true. Back at the press conference, the newfound romance began to wilt just a little. They asked about Boris Johnson. I said, yeah, they, how would he be as a prime minister? I said, he'll be a great prime minister. He's been very nice to me. He's been saying very good things about me as president. I think he thinks I'm doing a great job. I am doing a great job, that I can tell you, just in case you haven't noticed. What many had noticed is that Donald Trump also has eyes, well, for Donald Trump, and remains slavishly loyal to the issue that got him into politics in the first place, immigration. I think that's uh, very much hurt Germany. I think it's very much hurt other parts of Europe. And I know it's politically not necessarily correct to say that, but I'll say it, and I'll say it loud. And I think they better watch themselves, because you are changing culture, you are changing a lot of things, you're changing security, you're cha look at what's happening. I mean, you take a look. I mean, look at what's happening to different countries that never had difficulty, never had problems. It was Mrs. May's turn to find some steel. The UK has a proud history of welcoming people who are fleeing persecution to our country. We have a proud history of welcoming people who want to come to our country to contribute to our economy and contribute to our society. And over the years, overall immigration has been good for the UK. It's brought people with different backgrounds, different outlooks here to the UK, and has uh, and we've seen them contributing to our society and to our economy. And then, once again, there was the truth, or Trump's version of it. Well, if it. you remember, I was opening Turnberry the day before Brexit, and we had an unbelievably large number of reporters there because everybody was there, I guess, because of Brexit. And they all showed up on the ninth hole overlooking the ocean, and I said, uh, what's going on? And they all they wanted to talk about was Brexit. And they asked for my opinion, and I think you will agree that I said, I think Brexit will happen. And it did happen, and then we cut the ribbon. But so did this, 
the day after, not before Brexit. Your people have taken the country back, and there's something very, very nice about that. As a friend of Trump, does it not bother you that he just keeps lying about stuff? Well, I think the thing about Donald Trump is this, that you should never take him literally, but you should always take him seriously. One other reason why Trump was in a good mood could have been this. Inside, he'd been allowed to warm Churchill's armchair. The feel of the leather and the political pollen outside then egged him on to renew the vows that every British Prime Minister wants to hear from the lips of an American president. But can we take him seriously, if not literally? I would say the highest level of special. Now, am I allowed to go? Am I allowed to go higher than that? I'm not sure. But it's the highest level of special. They're very special people. It's a very special country. And as I said, you know, I have a relationship because my mother was born in Scotland. So very important. From the inflated Trump to the inflatable one, just about keeping in the skies above London, oblivious to the pageantry that hadn't even reached its climax in this state visit in everything but name. The Trumps meet the Queen at Windsor, the most elaborate cup of tea ever served with an awkward two-step. But this is what royalty is there for, to make memories above all for others. Well, our political editor, Gary Gibbon, was at Chequers today and he joins me now. And I suppose we really do have to admit this is a president without precedent. Absolutely. Knowing that Theresa May in Chequers a week ago had hammered out a deal that had taken two years to get there, knowing full well she'd lost cabinet ministers in the process. He gives an interview which you can only assume was intended to destabilise, um, accusing her of taking too long over Brexit, accusing her of betraying the electorate, accusing her of making a trade deal with America impossible because of the route that she is going down. He then stands next to her at Chequers recanting a bit, saying, oh, well, I've learned a bit more, a bit more than I uh, knew when I said those things. And he's also saying that he's been misquoted. Well, that's a bit raw, really, because he said, oh, there's an audio tape of this, uh, so you, you, I'll be able to prove I'm misquoted. The Sun newspaper did the interview, had an audio on their website for the entire day. What does Theresa May do in these circumstances? She grins and bears it, or grimaces a bit. And, and other people would, might have taken a different approach. That's her approach. We have to keep pinching ourselves about how extraordinary these times are. It's possible to get uh, shock fatigue. There's a president who couldn't come to London because he was scared of protests like this. Uh, a president who can't be relied on to say uh, rely, you know, things that are remotely loyal. It is absolutely extraordinary. And to add to the uh, sort of shock fatigue factor, we've just had the leader of the opposition here in the square at a demonstration saying the American president shouldn't be on British soil. I can't remember a moment in modern British history where anything like that has happened. Well, then there's the question of trade. And, she, and he said one of the most damaging things he could possibly said, which was, you know, if you go ahead with the way you're going at the moment, that was agreed in this place last week, you won't be doing any trade with us. Absolutely. And as ever, Donald Trump says something and then slightly tries to patch it up and say something different. And he did that in, in the garden of uh, Chequers earlier. On the way out of Chequers, I bumped into some Tory MPs who were going in, pro-Brexit MPs. They intend to rebel next week. They were on their way in for tea. They were click, barely cleaned up the lunch in Chequers. And they were totally unconvinced by the recanting of Donald Trump. They think he was being honest the first time, pushed into, the, into it the second. International visits like this are meant to build up the leader you're going to see. They're meant to build you both up to an extent. He hasn't built Theresa May up at all. He's knocked her to the ground and barely pulled her back to her feet. Gary Gibbon. Well, now, as he prepares to meet Vladimir Putin on Monday, President Trump has doubled down his attack on America's NATO allies, and now the European Union too. Then his day got even more complicated by the indictment of 12 Russian intelligence agents accused of hacking the Democratic Party during the 2016 election. Our international editor, Lindsay Hilson, is here with me now. Where does this leave the world, Lindsay? Well, before he started this trip, Donald Trump said that maybe after NATO and meeting Theresa May, President Putin was going to be the easiest bit. Well, maybe not. 
because the indictment of these 12 Russian officials actually challenges the legitimacy of his election, and that's why he's so angry. This is about the alleged Russian meddling in the American elections. Now, one of the things that um, other politicians in America, particularly Democratic senators, are very worried about is he's supposed to spend 10 minutes alone with President Putin. Well, we have this issue now. We have the issue of Syria, where mm. it is reported mm. that he might be trying to do a deal with the Russians, which mm. would really bring a lot of ballast to President Assad. And then Crimea. He blames the Russian invasion and annexation of Crimea on President Obama. So this is not going to be easy diplomatically, and the diplomats around him are extremely worried about what he's going to do. Well, uh, with the, one, one of the big questions really have to ask is, uh, you know, where does this all go? Because you can't believe him from one minute to the next. I mean, he says one thing and then he changes it and then he says it again. Yeah, but what he's doing is that there is a method, I think, in this method in his madness, you might say, which is that he says something extreme and then he rolls back. So the aim is to disrupt. Mm. The aim is to keep everybody guessing. But in a way, it's predictable. We know that that's what he does. So he does the interview with the son. He undermines the prime minister. And then he pulls back and says she's a, a tough and wonderful woman. But it does make him extremely difficult for other world leaders to deal with. Maybe even Vladimir Putin will find him difficult to deal with. Thanks very much indeed, Lindsay. Well, uh, now, uh, as you can see, this is quite a gathering here. If you look down on Trafalgar Square at uh, this moment, it's the most extraordinary picture. Uh, you've got, I mean, banners. Well, talk about banners. There are plenty of them. And uh, you, you, you've also got a sort of quite a festive atmosphere here in a sort of way. I mean, they don't like him, but they haven't seen him actually, for real. I mean, it's an extraordinary thing. When I was a student, I was brought here in 1961 to see JFK. My God, we wanted to see him. But no chance of any normal people seeing uh, Mr. Donald Trump. Not a chance. They're not going to take the risk of exposing Donald Trump to the great British public. So that's that. Now, I'm joined now by the Labour MP, Rishanara Ali, uh, and by Michael Avenatti. He's the lawyer representing Stormy Daniels, adult film actress who claims she had a consensual affair with President Donald Trump. Well, now, Roshanara, I mean, this is our ally. We, we've all learned to love America throughout our lives. Have we got to change our minds? Not at all. We love America. We love Americans. They are our allies. But we don't uh, approve or like what Donald Trump stands for. He's He's presided over expressing hatred towards women, towards Muslims, towards minorities, and he's locking up innocent children uh, in cages. Those are not the values we stand for, and it's right that people are here to stand against what he stands for, but we share values with, the, with, with American values, and we will always have a special relationship with Americans. Well, now, Mr. Avenatti, you are an American, yes. as I've mentioned. You've come over here effectively to protest. Well, that, that's correct. I've come over to send a message to our allies here in the UK and elsewhere in the world that they are not alone um, in their disdain for this president. This president is an embarrassment to the United States. He is interjecting instability into the world and instability into these alliances. And it's a very, very dangerous situation. There are millions of Americans, John, that feel just like I feel. They are ashamed of the conduct of this president. And we want to send a message that our allies are not alone in their concern. So what's the strategy with this case you're bringing for Stormy Daniels? I mean, it's just to embarrass him? No, not at all. It's to get to the bottom of it and to get to the truth. There's been a cover up here relating to this $130,000 payment. It doesn't have anything to do with the sex and who slept with who. It's all about truth and the American people finding out the truth and being entitled to the truth. But in the meantime, this president is playing a very dangerous game day in and day out. He's very unpredictable. And for 100 years, America has been seen as a shining light, a stable force in the world, and that's changing and it's disturbing. Well, well now, I mean, one of the things one finds oneself asking is, what about the trigger words that he uses in his speeches? It's all very well saying we're outraged and all the rest of it. But the fact is, the populism that he peddles, simply saying the word immigration raises a cheer amongst those people in the population who can be led by this sort of material. Well, look, we have to stand up for the values that we believe in. 
And I think it's disgraceful that our Prime Minister has rolled out the red carpet and found a way through the back door to have the monarch having to meet this man who stands for hatred, stands for things that uh, we don't believe in in our democracy. And frankly, the American president is not just the American president. He has an important role of leadership around the world. And that's why it's right that we should stand against it. And of course, but he was elected. in the rise, he was elected. yes, but in a democracy, people have the right to protest against elected representatives. And because he's a narcissist, um, he doesn't like that. He's hyper, hypersensitive and starts to go on the offensive. And frankly, our prime minister has seen this all blow up in her face because what, what has he done? He's humiliated her. He stood next to her and said Boris Johnson would make a better prime minister. But Michael Avanatsu, the fact is a lot of Americans love him. They love to hear his talk. They like his crude language. They're fed up with the elite. They're fed up with lawyers. They're fed up with politicians. And they've suffered over the last few years. And they're thrilled with Donald Trump. Well, Donald Trump is an, a very effective con man, and he conned a lot of Americans into believing something that just wasn't true. And that was he conned a lot of white Americans, frankly, into believing that their continued success depended on the trampling of rights of women, Muslims, immigrants, and people from our southern border, outside of our southern border. And that's just not true. And I believe that in time, and we've already seen a progression, more and more Americans are going to come to the conclusion that they've been conned and they will come to know that this is not the person that should represent the United States of America. Roshanara, let's just cut to the quick. Should he have been invited? He should have been invited. Certainly not for a state visit, certainly not for this uh, but he's our ally. State We've got visit lots of his in disguise. Here, I think it should have been an official visit. Theresa May met him in Brussels. She could have done business with him there. It didn't have to be organised in this way, where basically she hasn't honoured the wishes of the British people not to, you know, lay out the red carpet, engage the monarchy in this, and humiliate herself, but also the whole country. Very briefly, how will this go down in America? How will this go down? I, I think it's going to get a lot of attention, and I think it, people in America are going to realize how dangerous this situation is. And here's the bottom line. If you want to be president of the United States, you need to act presidential. Michael Avenatti, Roshan Arali, thank you very much for coming. Well, this afternoon, Lindsay Hilson was down among the crowds of protesters who've been converging here on Trafalgar Square. Organizers claim there's up to a quarter of a million people on the streets in what they call a carnival of resistance. Here's Lindsay's report full of hot air and hard to ignore. And I'm not talking about Churchill. The baby blimp was designed to mock a man never known to have laughed at a joke made at his expense. And not everyone in Parliament Square this morning appreciated the humour. Well, I'm from New Zealand and um, I probably think at the end of the day it is a little insulting to the American president and they should probably take it down. It's just a bit of humour and comedy, it's just a British way of making fun of politicians, so I think it's okay. The first march of the day was led by women. Praise the sexist, anti gay Donald Trump, go away! The fury they felt when Donald Trump was elected despite boasting about grabbing women's genitals has not diminished. I am a mixed race lesbian. Nothing that he stands for is for me and my people. So I want him to go. He has um, insulted our government and he's locked up babies in cages in America. And I just had to come out and make, make uh, join the kind of a collective expression of that disgust. This is a passionate crowd and it hasn't escaped them that the two leaders who President Trump has insulted on his trip to Europe are Angela Merkel and Theresa May, two older, powerful women. And the other leader who he singled out was the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, who happens to be a Muslim. Few here would be natural supporters of Theresa May, but that doesn't mean they were happy about President Trump undermining her. What do you think about the way President Trump has spoken about the Prime Minister? Absolutely disgraceful. I think he needs to learn to keep his mouth shut. I don't think we need to value a man's opinion who's a misogynist, a racist and a liar. A drag queen who'd come from Manchester found herself thinking about the 1930s and the rise of fascism. I think it's an important thing to remember the lessons of history. 
and where this kind of behaviour leads and the parallels, you know, that, that kind of use of right-wing support in order to gain political power and where that leads. Amongst the young radicals, old liberals and generally outraged, a couple of marchers seemed a little out of place. We love Trump. Ah, you love Trump? I do. So why are you on this march? Um, I just came to uh, march for Trump. Do you feel a little outnumbered? Sorry? Do you feel a little outnumbered? A little bit. A little, bit. A little uncomfortable? No, I'm OK here. Yeah. By mid-afternoon, the second march had started, bigger and broader, organised by various left-wing groups but nonetheless attracting some who are not habitual protesters, yet feel strongly about President Trump. Once they'd arrived in Trafalgar Square, the crowd was addressed by the Labour leader. Here in London and around this country, our message to our visitor is, we are united in our hope for a world of justice, not division. We're united in our hope Misogyny. President Trump avoided London because he didn't want to witness scenes like this. But it's hard to imagine that he won't hear about the protest or see it on television and realise that many in the nation's capital did not welcome his visit. Lindsay Hilson, and a tiny little news flash. It's raining in London, and that, for anybody living south of the wash, is news after a month of none of it. More from us here in Trafalgar Square in a moment. Now over to Matt in the studio. Thanks, John. Now, we've repeatedly asked for a government minister to appear on tonight's programme, but none were available. We did want to hear from the Conservatives, though, so we are now joined by, from Crick Howell in Wales by the leading Brexiteer and chair of the European Research Group, Jacob Rees-Mogg. Welcome to the programme, Jacob Rees-Mogg. What do you make of those demonstrations, tens of thousands oh, of people in London? Well, it's a free country. People are entitled to demonstrate. OK, good. Now, you're an impeccably... You're famous for being an impeccably polite and cultured man. Do you think that Donald Trump's interview with The Sun was impeccably polite and the right thing to do as a guest in this country? Well, um... He wasn't a guest in the country at the point. He was coming here. Well, and he was, he was on his way here. a very straightforward question about... He was on his way here. He was asked a question about trade, and what he said is completely consistent with what the government's put in its white paper. You just need to look at page 49, paragraph 163, which says, in the context of trade negotiations, a common rule book for goods would limit the UK's ability to make changes okay. to regulation in those areas covered by the rule book. And as non-tariff barriers are nowadays more important than tariff barriers, this will make trade deals with countries like the United States, but others beyond, extremely difficult. Right. So Donald Trump was speaking the truth, and that's very important. So when it comes to Brexit, the existential issue of our time, you agree with Donald Trump? On trade, the government agrees with Donald Trump. It's in its white paper. And do you think it was right for him to praise Boris Johnson as a wonderful prime minister? That's a bit rude, isn't it, to Theresa May? Why, why, is that, why is that rude? He was asked what he thought about Boris Johnson. He said he thought Boris Johnson was absolutely marvellous. He wasn't asked what he thought about Jeremy Corbyn. He may have said he thought Jeremy Corbyn was a splendid fellow too. I think you're completely entitled to praise people. And look what he said about Mrs May at Chequers, how wonderful uh, he thinks she is, how admirable uh, and, and how successful. So he's praising everybody. He's a very generous man with his praise. And when he was praising Theresa May at Chequers, do you actually believe him? I mean, he seems to be changing his mind quite a lot about people. He did the same thing with Angela Merkel. He was very rude about her you know, on Twitter and in interviews, and then he was very nice to her in person. That seems to be a bit of form there, doesn't it? Well, I, I think he is a man who wants to put the interests of his country first and is tough in the way he negotiates and discusses things with other nations. But personally, he's very polite about people. Uh, and the um, Chequers News Conference was an example of his good manners. But you know, this is a country that's divided uh, about Brexit, and you have you in a party that's deeply divided about what kind of Brexit it wants. So, are you happy to have the to be behind the Donald Trump version of Brexit rather than the Prime Minister's version of Brexit? Well, as I said, the Donald Trump version of Brexit is what the government has put out in its white paper. 
Now, Downing Street may be spinning something else, but that something else simply isn't right. That if you leave non-tariff barriers in place, it will be difficult to do trade deals. That's a fact. That's in the white paper. The government has accepted it. And if we're in the common rule book, which is in fact the EU's rule book, uh, we will have the EU making our rules and effectively determining our ability to do trade deals. And that isn't Brexit. And whatever spin comes out of, of Downing Street, mm. it still won't make it Brexit. There were quite a few members of your own party today who said to Donald Trump, can you please leave us alone, don't meddle in our politics, butt out. Obviously, you don't agree with them. Well, I think it's silly to be discourteous to Donald Trump, who is our closest ally and a very important global figure, with a democratic mandate from uh, the United States of America. Uh, and there are some people, and you had that lawyer on a moment ago being introduced, interviewed by Jon Snow, who are very sniffy about Americans voting. Uh, and uh, I trust American democracy, so I think we must be respectful to the American right. president. And he's not interfering in our affairs. But when Obama came here, he was coming during an election period and interfered directly. What Donald Trump has said is how America will react but in terms of negotiating a trade deal if right. the UK is but tied in the EU's rule book. You That's know, a matter of American foreign Trump policy. Has, first of all, Trump has come at an incredibly delicate time. The Foreign Secretary resigned on Monday. Um, you know, you could say this is a government in crisis. We may not have an election, but we are in a very perilous state. And at the same time, when Obama was here, you accused him of meddling. Obama was coming during an election campaign uh, and was um, putting out a campaign line written for him uh, by Downing Street, which was a pretty shameful thing to do. The fact that this government has had a bit of a wobble this week is hardly Donald Trump's fault. We're not in an election period, and he has spoken about American foreign policy. But he's about trampled how all America over it. Do trade deals. He's come here that to trample all over our rather sorry. delicate you know, politics at the moment. Well, he's not trampling all over it. He's asked, will America do a trade deal if the UK is stuck with the European Union's rule book? To which the answer is probably not. That's just a straight answer to a straight question about American interest. That's not interfering in British politics. And the recent instability in British politics can hardly fairly be blamed on Donald Trump. He may be responsible for many things, but not the resignation of Boris Johnson and David Davis. That was because of this awful white paper. Are you more loyal to Donald Trump than you are to Britain? S sorry? Are you more loyal to Donald Trump than you are uh, to Britain? Oh, don't be silly. No, of course, my loyalty is to the Queen and to the country. May she reign over us for many years to come. It's the first Jacob time anyone's probably said, God save the Queen on Channel 4 News. Thank you. <laughs> Jacob Rees-Mogg, thank you very much indeed. Now, back to those protesters. Thousands of protesters have also gathered in the centre of Glasgow. Donald Trump is due to fly into the city's Prestwick Airport shortly, what's billed as a private weekend visit. He and Melania are expected to stay at their luxury golf resort nearby to play golf. Our Scotland correspondent, Kieran Jenkins, is in Glasgow. Kieran, what's it like out there? Well, President Trump expected to land in Scotland very shortly. Over the course of the evening, we've had a few thousand people come out here to give him the welcome they think uh, he deserves. Yesterday, President Trump said he had great friendships in Scotland. Not too many of those in evidence here tonight or anywhere in the country where there have been protests, not just in London, in Sheffield, in Belfast, in Manchester. Many thousands have turned out to have their voices heard. But of course, a theme of this presidential visit is just how far away from the people he has been in royal castles, in country estates, and now to golf courses. He's landing in Prestwick Airport about an hour away from here behind a deep police cordon, and that's where the official part of this visit ends. It becomes a private visit then, uh, and he's going to his own golf resort, Turnbury in South Ayrshire, where he will meet his son, Eric, um, who reportedly flew in yesterday accompanied by 40 or so American businessmen, no doubt keen to bend the president's ear on the golf course. Now, the security bill for that private Trump uh, gathering at Turnbury will be met by the British taxpayer. He'll be running to some a few million pounds. Uh, and there have been questions raised uh, about that. But Donald Trump this afternoon was talking about his last visit to Tur Turnbury in 2016, uh, which he said was before uh, the Brexit referendum. He predicted the Brexit result. Only one problem. He actually arrived the day after uh, the Brexit referendum when the result was already known. Untruths, of course, are factors swirling around his presidency. Protests, too, and there will be more of these 
tomorrow in Edinburgh and Turnbury and, in cross, and across the country. Kieran Jenkins in Glasgow, thanks very much indeed. Well, here there's been a lot of back and forth about the prospects for a US-UK trade deal after Brexit today. Mr Trump earlier claiming that Theresa May's plan would probably kill any such deal, later somewhat changing his tune. So how critical, how crucial is American cooperation? Well, our economics correspondent, Helia Ebrahimi, is with me. Helia, why does it matter so much? Well, we know that uh, the EU accounts for 43% of uh, British exports, but it's actually the United States that's the single biggest market for British exports, accounting for 18% of everything we send. Now, overall, Britain has a trade deficit, but actually we sell more to Americans, giving us a £42 billion surplus with them. And what do we sell them? Well, we sell them cars, we sell them drugs, we sell them uh, mechanical power generators, art, refined oil. This is the whole gamut of British industry, all the way from aerospace to pharmaceuticals. So it really does have an impact, Matt, on the British economy. So what are the stumbling blocks? You had this very interesting division when it came to the white paper between services, which is banking and legal work, and goods. Now, services got a hard Brexit split from EU rules, but goods got the full soft Brexit treatment. And President Trump isn't happy with that because agriculture is hugely important to American exporters. And if we're going to have this bilateral deal with the Americans, they want us to be able to ditch EU rule book. And under Theresa May's current plans, that's not going to happen. So what does this tell us about the changing nature of global trade? Well, you see Trump trying to challenge world order, world trade, and... Although the issues are not new, his tactics are. And you've seen that with the trade war with China. You've seen that with the current spat about car tariffs with Europe. And from the American perspective, they think it's working. Of course, the risk is that if you move to a splintering world order, like we saw in the 1930s, then you could see that spiral very quickly. And for the junior partner, mm. which would be us, in this case, is especially dangerous. Heli Ibrahimi, thanks very much indeed. Well, we're joined now from Palm Beach in Florida by Sebastian Gorka, former deputy assistant to President Trump in the White House, now on commentator on Fox News. Welcome to the programme, Sebastian Gorka. You're a British citizen, um, although you worked uh, in the White House and you're now in Florida. When you see those pictures of thousands of demonstrators on the streets of London today, does that make you proud of British democracy? Uh, I'm an American citizen now, but I was born in the UK. Mm. And yes, uh, I'm glad that the UK is not a totalitarian uh, country where you're not allowed to disagree politically. So yes, whether it's demonstrations with regards to Brexit, which is a reassertion of British sovereignty, or the arrival of a head of state, that's what democracy is all about. And as an advisor, as a former advisor to the president, would you have advised him to give that interview to the Sun and say those things? Uh, he, he is the master communicator. Uh, he knows exactly what he's doing, whether it's a 2 a.m. tweet or whether it's an interview mm -hmm. with one of the most popular newspapers in the U.K. So he doesn't need anyone's advice when it comes to strategic communications. The fact that he's got 53 million mm -hmm. followers alone on Twitter tells you everything you need to know. Yet, yet he spent quite a lot of the day on an apology tour, squirming in front of Theresa May, saying sorry for the things he'd said to the Sun. So which is the version, the real version of the truth? The Sun version or the version we heard at the press conference at Chequers? Well, look, I grew up in the UK and I know there's not a lot of Tories at Channel 4 or ITN. Uh, the idea of you saying anything nice about Donald Trump uh, is absolutely absurd. Oh, no, come, 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 come. I'm just asking that, you which is, is the right version. This is a man... This is, this is a man who has never squirmed in his life. If you think that he was squirming today, you live in an Alice in Wonderland fairy tale. What's wrong with a bit of humility? He did actually apologise today. I mean, he did utter those words. Nothing, there's nothing wrong with humility. You use the word squirming. Oh. You use the word squirming. He has... I worked for him. I worked for him before he was president. I worked for him in the Oval Office. The words squirm and Donald Trump have never, ever been applied in the same sentence. So I know it's wishful thinking, perhaps, on your behalf, but it's not a reflection of reality. It was an incredible meeting. The fact that they were holding hands as they came down the staircase, the meeting with the Queen, that is how it is done.
indeed. Uh, very, uh, that was a very moving moment, the two of them holding hands. Let me talk to you about something else. Um, and this is the indictment of 12 named Russian agents hacking into the DNC. Indictments you know, today in the United States, that is pretty serious, isn't it? That's a very serious allegation leveled at the Trump campaign, because those agents helped Donald Trump hang on, through hang the hacking on, hang on, hang get on. elected. At the Trump, at the Trump campaign, you haven't e clearly you haven't even read the indictment. It has absolutely nothing to do with the Trump campaign. That's the absurdity of the last 415 days of the Mueller probe that has not brought one indictment connected to the Trump campaign. Not one connection between Russia and the Trump campaign. The idea that Paul Manafort was indicted for wire fraud 12 years ago well, with regards to a contract we, that he executed with the Ukraine. Come on, do, do some well, homework, well, please. Look, so here, so guess what? We've done the homework. It says very clearly that these Russian agents have been indicted. These spies spied. 12 yes. named Russian spies agents have been, indict, have been indicted yes. for helping the Trump campaign, for hacking into the DNC. No, I, you just made that up. You just, literally, this is the definition of fake news. Nothing in the indictment says that they were hacking into the DNC to help Donald Trump. You are literally committing fake news live influence on British television. Influence the election. You the, influence the, fact, the election you think, against Hillary you Clinton. Think, you helped Donald Trump. You, there are only two candidates in listen, that election. Um, listen, the, the indictment states that members of the Russian intelligence services spied. So, newsflash, there's gambling going on in this casino, and I'm shocked. If you, if you, if you think this is new, then you haven't opened a history book. The, the Russians have been doing this since about 1918. And does that not worry you? Does it not alarm you, as an American citizen, that Russian agents are hacking into an American election, trying to influence the world's greatest democracy? They are the most... Look... Uh, Kim Philby, Anthony Burgess, McLean were at the highest level of British government working directly for the Kremlin. So if you think that you're going to get on a high horse and talk about how damaging it is to the U.S., you should look in the mirror first. It's what the Russians do. Uh, it's just their mode of behavior. And the fact that they're being indicted is wonderful news. But they're Russian nationals in Russia, so nothing's going to become of it. So if that is what Russians do and have always done, are you confident that President Trump, when he meets President Putin in Helsinki on Monday, will not be taken for a ride? <laughs> You are, this is just so amusing. Taken for a ride. The man who had never held public office before, ever, not at the state level, not at the county level, destroyed a woman in a political campaign who was, who was fettered by the left-wing media. The New York Times said she has a 92% chance of victory. That man's going to be played. A man who is a billionaire New, New York real estate magnet mm. in the hardest market in the right. world. That guy's going to be played. But, Not on your Nelly, my friend. You may think this is funny, but, you know, when you talk to Eastern Europeans, you know, people living in the Baltic republics or in Poland or indeed in Hungary, which is where your father came from originally. Is that right? Yes. They are worried. They are deeply worried about what Vladimir Putin might be up to. But you, you may think it's funny. They're on the sharp end. They don't think it's funny. Don't you think that I don't need, you should I don't be worried? Need you don't you to think, lecture me I'm not on lecturing what you. Hungarians I'm just, think. I'm not lecturing you. I'm just asking why you're laughing at something that people who live in those countries, you know, on the sharp end, including, you know, in Hungary, where your, you know, your father came from, this is a place that was run over, you uh -huh. know, rolled over by Russian tanks in 56. Don't they deserve to be taken seriously when they're afraid of Vladimir Putin? And oh, are you confident uh, yes, and that they Trump are a little, will a little bit, reflect a little their bit more? They're, they're, they're being taken a damn sight more seriously than President Obama took them. A man who did absolutely nothing when Russia rolled into Crimea and annexed that territory. In the last year and a half, Donald Trump has taken every single policy decision in a way that is bad for Putin, whether it's unleashing oil exploration in the Anwar district, whether it is uh, in increasing sanctions on Russia, whether it's increasing mm. NATO spending, increasing our defense budget. And last of all, don't lecture me when we are actually giving arms to the Ukraine. Do you know what Obama gave to the Ukraine? Mm. And this isn't a joke. This is truth. He gave them blankets and socks.
Right. Socks. That's okay. really going to stop the Russian hordes, isn't it? So is, in your book, is Donald Trump friend or foe? He is a friend to anybody in the Judeo-Christian civilization who stands by Western values. The most important speech he has ever given is the Warsaw speech, where he reasserted American leadership and he said, if you are part of Western culture, if you believe in Judeo-Christian values like we do, we will stand shoulder to shoulder with you, whether you are Israel, whether you are Belgium, whether you are the UK. That's Donald Trump and everything he has done has supported that statement, from arming the Ukrainians, from standing up to Russians, mm. to kicking out. You know how many, how many agents Germany kicked out after mm. the Skripal assassination? Three. Yeah. We kicked out okay. 60. So who's taking Russia seriously? Just one more. I mean, in Who? the press conference today, uh, there was a fascinating moment when Donald Trump returned to the subject that is very close to his heart, immigration. And he gave a very dark vision of the effects of immigration on Europe, which was then rebuffed by Theresa May, who said, well, actually, immigration hasn't been bad for this country. Where do you stand on that? Well, it depends. May versus which, which, Trump depends on, which on this issue of immigration. Right. Well, it depends which immigration you're talking about. When I grew up as a kid in West London and the school bus driver was Jamaican, my best mate was from uh, Ireland, my other mate was from Pakistan, that was great because those people, those families integrated as Brits. Mm. But today, when you have female genital mutilation in Bradford, when you have honor killings, when you have grooming gangs, that kind of in the in immigration is not good for anybody. Donald Trump in his press conference today seemed to be talking about immigration in general. And, you know, had a very, you keep laughing, but it's a very important point. Immigration in general as a very, you're, dark, you're as a very dark, as a very dark vision for Europe. And actually, you know, the, not only the British Prime Minister, but many people in this country thought that his, aunt, his particular assertion was not just anti-immigrant, but also, frankly, tinged with a bit of racism. Now, this is why it's so important to come on channels like yours that are so utterly biased. I've worked for the man, and I know the man. There isn't a racist molecule in his body. This is a man who has pardoned black individuals already because they were convicted for racist reasons. Mm. His child, his daughter, is Jewish. His grandchildren are Orthodox Jews. And when the media and the loony left call him a racist and a bigot and anti-Semite, they are liars and they are reprehensible. This man is talking about the kinds of immigration that has caused Brexit, the kind that have, has caused all kinds of terrorism across Europe. That kind of immigration isn't good for anybody. Sebastian Rucker, thanks very much indeed. Thank you, Matt. Well, I'm joined now by two of today's protesters, Dr. Shola Moshok Bamimu, co-organizer of the Bring the Noise Women's March, and Majid Majid, former Somali refugee and now Lord Mayor of Sheffield, who used his post there to ban Donald Trump from visiting his city. Now, Mr. Mayor, wouldn't you rather have had a conversation? Shouldn't you have invited him and confronted him rather than banned him? Well, John, what I'm trying to do is really highlight not only how dangerous Donald Trump's policies is. But basically just to say, as a country and the people of Sheffield that stand for equality, stand up for people's rights, that he's not actually welcome in Sheffield because Sheffield was the first city of sanctuary. So everything that Donald Trump represents is not what we stand for. And by actually allowing him and inviting him to the UK, what we do is legitimise everything that he stands for. But it would surely be much easier to just try and have a conversation with him rather than just not have him at all. Well, this is what it is. The people of America, they're our friends. And of course, friends are honest with each, each other, John. When your friend is stepping out of line, you need to be honest and straightforward with them and say, no, you're not welcome here. All right. Well, now, well, what about the Women's March? I, I mean, <laughs> is it in part because you, you are worried about his misogyny, which, of course, is notorious, uh, mm. or, or are you worried about race? This is so much more than that because it is, it's trans, what, what is happening and what we are doing transcends the very boundaries of all the things that we represent. The reason why Bring the Noise was put together today was for the people to stand together in solidarity against the inhumane, divisive, misogynistic and discriminatory policies from Shouldn't the Trump administration. Shouldn't the solidarity be men and women? There were men there and drag queens. It but was, it was the Women's March led by women uh -huh. because you know when women get together we are too hard to ignore yeah. so as you can see from today there were over 70,000 people on the women's march alone what we stand for is to dismantle the political rhetoric of hate phobia 
fear that's coming out of the Trump Pence administration. As a woman, do you feel sympathy with Mrs. May? No. No, not at all. Miss, Mrs. May. <laughs> Mrs. <laughs> Theresa May has a job to do. The bottom line is, as a people, we are the government. And we're saying to Theresa May, you must represent us. In the last 24 hours, Donald Trump has shown again what kind of ally he is, which he is not. So it's important that we, the people, we've shown today that we are radical without losing focus and we are bold without restraint. What about what Mr. Trump said about Europe and immigrants? He says Europe is losing its identity. That's a funny thing to hear on the heels of the World Cup. Yeah. And, you know, just on the touch of the World Cup, if you look at what the England team have done is what a lot of our politicians have failed to do. They've actually united the country, regardless right. of what your race, background, religion, everything is, they've actually united it. And just look at p people here today. You've literally got everyone from different backgrounds just to send that message, whether you're gay, yeah. black, yeah. women, we're going to stand shoulder yeah. to shoulder with you and actually fight this misogyny. So That's you right. would argue that this is Europe? I would argue that Europe reflects what the unity of all of us are. But more importantly... Don't the... encourage them, Mr. Mayor. Do not yeah. encourage them. But more importantly are the British values that we hold. What we did today, all of these people that are standing here, has shown how our diversity transcends the boundaries of ethnicity, gender, race, anyone's choice of sex. So nobody on God's given earth being Donald Trump can stand against us. And you win. can't hear her, Mr. Mayor, but do you agree with her? 110%. That's right. 110%. Yeah. But seriously, Sheffield is a very, a, a very multicultural city. Yeah. It really is. Can it be undone? No, do you know what it is? People are always going to have their opinions, but I think by us coming together and saying, do you know what? This person stands for everything as a city, like, we are living in a politics which is fueled with hate and division. And the last thing we need is somebody like Donald That's Trump right. that literally not just That's legitimizes right. it, but also makes it human. It's like we need to do everything to stop that being normalized. I can't let you go without saying that I think a lot of people looking in will be staggered that a Somali refugee became mayor of Sheffield. Well, do you know what? It's, it's, it's amazing. I think that's a testament to the people of Sheffield to say, do you know what? We're very proud of doing That's things right. differently. And it's great. But you see, like you, Donald Trump was democratically elected. Yeah, well, you have to pay your money and take your choice. Yeah, but it doesn't mean that we have to agree with him or That's welcome right. or roll That's the right. red carpet out okay. for him. So it yeah. really isn't like that. I think it's clear that we and the American people, the British people and American people, will always have a special relationship. And we respect the office of the White House. We respect the democratic elections and their decisions. But we will not accept what is unacceptable. So if they put so as they put someone like Trump and Pence in charge, we have to rise up and stand up and say these are our values. So when Theresa May and the cabinet sit with him, they have to take note of what we want because if they don't represent us, we will vote them out. Well, I want to thank you both very warmly. Well. Tonight's main news: Donald Trump is on his way to Scotland tonight after lavishing. Warm praise on Theresa May at their joint press conference in Chequers, claiming US-UK relations are at the highest level of special. This in rather stark contrast to his interview in the Sun newspaper this morning, when he savaged Mrs May and her Brexit strategy. At the same time, here in central London, hundreds of thousands of people have turned out to protest against Mr Trump's visit. Organisers are calling a carnival of resistance. That, I'm afraid, is all we've got time for tonight. But we'll be back tomorrow night, half past six. Until then, from Matt in the studio, all of us here in Trafalgar Square, that's Channel 4 News. Have a great evening.